Master Eda was an amazing teacher. He was truly a genius, somebody who only studied until third grade to be as knowledgeable and as proficient as a teacher as he was. He was a true psychologist without ever having read any books on the subject and he would transform lives and give people confidence and raise their self-esteem through the art of jiu-jitsu and, and I today my work is much easier from learning the way that he taught and the examples that he used. When it comes to, to teaching and talking about Elio Gracie as a teacher, I can say that there has never been a better teacher than Elio Gracie. Everything he taught me, I used basically in everything I did in my life. The most important attribute of a teacher was his ability to inspire the student. And to inspire the student, he believed that a teacher should possess uh, certain morals, and certain values that were extremely important. A teacher is a role model to children, to adults. He was always giving the best of himself to make this, you know, his student improve, understand the technique in the best way possible. And he always lived and taught jiu-jitsu and worked to protect the roots of this philosophy that he preached and the roots of jiu-jitsu. He used to say, look, if they can do it, I can do it too. It was very interesting. That, that, that alone is a lesson that I carry with me till today. O Grimestre Helio was always willing to help and to talk to whoever would come seeking for help. Perfection. He was about you know, doing everything he did the best way possible. And Grimestre Helio always tried to make the class as positive and as, as fun as possible. Remaster Elio was probably the most courageous fighter ever, in my opinion, feared by many. But I remember him as being such a loving person, almost like a grandfather to us. To tell you the truth, I don't really remember the first time that I met Grandmaster Elio because since the first memories that I have of my life, Grandmaster Elio was already present. We always refer to him as Chiu Elio, which in English is Uncle Elio. I know from pictures that the first time I met when Master Elio was in his house in the mountains in Itaipava when I was two years old, 1977. I was uh, wearing a kimono and on top of a horse with my dad also wearing a kimono. That's a famous picture, but I have to admit that I don't remember that day. I remember the day that I found out that his name was not Chiu Elio. I thought his name was Chiu Elio. I kind of connected both names and I, I, I thought it was just one name. And I remember finding out that, no, Chiyu, Uncle Elio. Well, we, we were very fortunate and I'm very thankful for, for my dad's relationship with Grandmaster Elio, uh, the fact that he taught my grandfather classes and, and that allowed us to, to live with him and to have, you know, a, you know, be in contact with him in a very special way. Whenever I slept um, in the same house as him, be it in Brazil when I was younger at his ranch many times I spent weekends and even a whole month one time also when he came to visit us here in Miami the thing I remember the most waking up is that he actually woke us up he would wake up earlier he would prepare our juices he would knock on the door and always very quietly he didn't want to wake us up abruptly and he would tell us that the juice was ready we would have breakfast um, we would you know always sit at the table have our juice usually he really liked this uh, banana watermelon juice combination. We would drink the juice and as soon as the juice we were finished with breakfast we would go out and start you know working on the property. There was always something to do. I never remember seeing Graham Australia you know just like bored when people say oh I'm bored I don't have anything to do. He was always with something to do. He would walk around make sure that the workers were doing a good job and many times he was very hands-on and he would actually go and work with uh, the most basic um, uh, duties that were uh, needed at his um, ranch. He believed that if he had to, to hire someone for a job to fix a fence or to work even in his bathroom, if he did not know how to do it himself, 
he would then take advantage of the fact that that person was there doing their job and he would sometimes even put a little chair and just observe and try to learn what that person was doing. And he used to say, look, if they can do it, I can do it too. It was very interesting. That, that, that alone is a lesson that I carry with me till today because he felt that he should know he should be self-sufficient, that there was not one thing that he could not do. And the day would continue. We would come back, have lunch. His wife always cooked the best Gracie diet food. And um, as soon as we finished lunch, we would have a nap. I remember that when I was young, sometimes with, with Hawkson, his, his grandson, Hickson's first son, he, you know, we, we would sometimes escape out the window you know, Grandmaster Eddie would put us in our room. You guys now go to bed, but sleep for at least 45 minutes, an hour, and we would escape out the window to go play outside. But but as I got older, I started to really appreciate the, the, the nap time. And this is something also I try to do until today when I have the time to, to nap a little bit after lunch. We would wake up and after the nap time, and that's usually when we would train. He used to he used to ask always, "Are you feeling good?" And I knew that when he asked that in Portuguese was "tais disposto," and like, "Are you feeling good?" And I knew that that meant training time. And even if you weren't feeling good, you always answered, "Yeah, we're feeling good." Many times I remember starting to train maybe at 3, 4 p.m. and staying in the mat until 8, 9 p.m. almost when it was time to eat dinner, and uh, you know. Grandmaster Helio never taught a class thinking on the time, maybe you know, the class is over. He was always giving the best of himself to make this, you know, his student improve, understand the technique in the best way possible. And then we would spend hours on the mat reviewing techniques and that's when Grandmaster Helio really shined. He just loved being on the mat, talking about Jiu Jitsu. His conviction is something that is unparalleled. And, and we really enjoyed learning from him and, and tapping into all those years of experience, somebody who had trained for 80 years before that. So it was always um, a huge, um, an amazing experience to, to train with him. There was one time, I was about 13 years old, that he invited this farmer that was helping him. The guy was a very powerful, strong guy, and I had been there for a while already training with him. And actually, that was the first time I trained without a kimono. And so I think to test me, he, he invited this, this farmer and he just told the farmer, look, the kid is young, but don't worry, smash him. And the farmer kind of, you know, just listened to, to Grandmaster Helio and, and, and we started straining, started sparring, and he caught me in a headlock. He caught me in a headlock. And I remember that as, you know, I was caught and it was, you know, it was a pretty tough move. I looked at Grandmaster Helio. I looked at his eyes, almost like hoping that he saw that I was in a bad position and that he would say, you know, time, or he would stop it. But I would never ask, you know, I would never quit. But he, you know, I think he was confident that I could escape. So, you know, after, you know, having my, my head and my ears um, squeezed for, for maybe, I don't know the time, but maybe for a minute, I was able to to escape and you know from the headlock usually you find yourself on on the person's back and eventually he called time and, and he was very happy with my with my performance I remember you know certain games that he used to do and uh, and thinking back nowadays you know understanding how important it is to give confidence to a small child I can see that that was everything that he was trying to achieve putting me from hanging with my feet up in the air, hanging upside down and swinging me from one side of the room to the other, you know, was always so that I had confidence that I wouldn't have to be holding on with my hands, you know, certain games as far as doing flips over his back and falling on my feet, working on my base, you know, working on my agility. And uh, a lot of these games are things that we apply nowadays at our school here in Miami. And we use these games to give confidence to the kids in teaching. I still have a memory of a class with him where um, he was simulating a real fight. And I was probably five or six years old. And I threw a punch and hit him in the mouth. 
and I remember that he started bleeding and I became a little scared that I had hurt him and he started praising me for having been able to hit the champion Elio Gracie with a punch and make him bleed. So he actually made me feel good about it and made sure that I, that I was not feeling any type of um, bad or negative feelings for having um, punched him or, or made him make him bleed. He had so much confidence in his defense that he wanted me to spar in the adult class because I would train on the weekends at his house and I would train during the week at the Academia Gracie in Rio and he wanted me to go to the adult class in Rio and spar at a time with the you know, world-renowned champions that were training at the, Gracie, at the Academia Gracie and he wanted me to train with them and not get caught. That's how much you know, confidence that he had in his, in his defense. And I remember improving and getting better. You know, people were having a harder time catching me. And I remember one time that I, maybe it was luck, out of luck, I didn't spar with the top guys, but I went back to the, to the, to the mountains and I told my master, look, I sparred this week and nobody caught me. And uh, he's like, really? And he went to the phone, he called Hoyler, and he said, look, Hoyler, Joaquin just came back. He said it sparred with everyone in the school, no one caught him. So next time he goes there, spar with him. You know, I want you to test him out, you know, tell him to lie down, mount on him, attack him, try to catch him. And I knew it already. I said, next time I'm in the school, Hoyler's going to run me over. And I remember going back and Hoyler attacking me. And, uh, but it was always very good because every time I got caught, that was good, valuable information that I would, I would bring back during the weekend for Grandmaster Ed. And that's exactly what he wanted. You know, he wanted to test whatever he would teach me. And if I, if I happened to lose, if I happened to get caught, you know, he would um, explain that it was a mistake on my part, that he believed that the defense system was perfect and that if I did everything the way it was supposed to be, that no one should be able to catch me. When Master Erda was an amazing teacher, he was truly a genius, somebody who only studied until third grade to be as knowledgeable and as proficient as a teacher as he was. He was a true psychologist without ever having read any books on the subject and he would transform lives and give people confidence and raise their self-esteem through the art of jiu-jitsu and, and I, today my work is much easier from learning the way that he taught. He was maybe the best driver that I ever met in my life. You know, he saw driving as something that he was always improving. You know, just uh, using the clutch to using the brakes, to the amount of pressure he used on the gas, on the pedal gas, everything was, was detailed. And it was great for us, especially for me. The first time I, I drove a car was with him by my side. And to him it was very important that we knew how to drive well. And he always taught us that three signs of being a bad driver was to use the brakes too much, to use the horn, and to squeak the tires. So to this day, I remember to try to avoid those things. He was always using analogies of driving, comparing to Jiu-Jitsu the same way that he always seeked to find perfection in Jiu-Jitsu. He was looking to find perfection in everything he did. And driving was ju just one of the um, things that he would do in a daily basis that he would apply, you know, Jiu-Jitsu. One time when I was traveling to America the first time, um, I was 13 years old, this was 1988, and it was a very special time for me because as a 13-year-old teenager, I was going to America together with Hickson, Hoyler, Hansel, Helion, Carlos Machado. We were all in the airport getting ready to go to America. And I remember we went to the second floor of the international airport in Rio to be able to eat something. Some of us were hungry and, and we're ordering some sandwiches. And suddenly somebody comes running and said, not knowing who we were, saying, you don't know what happened. Elio Grace just knocked out somebody downstairs. We were maybe a couple yards away from my mom, where my mom and Grandmaster Elio's wife 
were. Um, and I guess because of this distance, some guy, some, some crazy guy, approached both my mom and Grim Asedo's wife, and he started in a very rough and disrespectful way, kind of funny way, asking them questions about flights and just starting, you know, just trying to start conversation. So as soon as Grameste Elio felt what was going on, he, he stood up very respectfully. And I remember that that actually was something that, that, that I really remember, that he, he, he was very respectful in how he approached the man. And Grameste Elio interrupted him and said, Sir, please, they don't know any of this information. Um, leave them alone. And the guy was very disrespectful to Grandmaster Edu and said, shut up, you know, and, and I'm just talking to them. And Grandmaster Edu stood up and the guy was like, I'm not going to beat you up because of your white hair. And at that point, Grandmaster Edu went into a fighting stance and the guy positioned himself like a martial artist and started um, positioning himself to fight. Charged at Grandmaster Edu. Grandmaster Edu used a sidekick. Uh, he was using one of the, at the time, uh, I think a top cider is how we, a dock cider is how we called it in Brazil and the shoe flew, and, but he kept his, um, his fighting stance. And at that point, my father, who had noticed what was happening, he came around very discreetly, and noticing that the guy was um, wanting to fight and being very aggressive, he threw a slap to the guy's face very quickly and stepped back. The interesting thing is that the, the, my dad's slap was so discreet and so quick that most of the people that were watching this thought that it was Grandmaster Edu's arm because my dad's arm kind of came over Grandmaster Edu's shoulder. Uh, the guy spun and hit his head on the wall and fell, knocked out, knocked down. And everybody clapped their hands and, and everybody was like, wow, Edu Gracie, because you know, by that point people realized it was Edu Gracie. Edu Gracie knocked out this guy who was you know, attacking his wife and this and that. And when we got there, everything had been over already and even the guy had been taken away. Uh, federal police came and you know the guy as he got up he said oh they attacked me and, and the cop the police was like Elio Grace attacked you it means you're going to jail. <laughs> I told the guy he was going to jail and as this was happening then my brother I remember my brother Hickson and you know Hoyler and I think Hansel was there too they all came and but everything had already happened and, and they were just you know kind of upset that they weren't there for the for the fight, but um, that was a very interesting day. Grand Master Elio had very strong views about Jiu Jitsu and about life. He was um, very opinionated and he believed in always doing what he felt was right. He was an idealist and many people b confuse this conviction that he had, this strong belief in his ideas and his principles and his philosophies, they confuse that with arrogance. And he was definitely not arrogant. He was very humble and he was very generous and very kind, extremely kind. But when it came time to defend his ideals and his principles and the things that he had studied his whole life, then he would talk very strongly and he would defend his views very strongly and he wouldn't bend in order um, to, and he wouldn't accommodate his views to make others happy. He was definitely not politically correct and he stood up by his views. He was never um, afraid to admit when he had made a mistake and he did that on a few occasions. But when he believed something was right, he went all the way to the end. And some people accused him of being radical, not understanding that the word radical comes from a Latin word which means root and he always lived and taught Jiu Jitsu and worked to protect the roots of this philosophy that he preached and the roots of Jiu Jitsu.